It's like almost an empty row. Where is everyone, Pete? All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here this morning. I am here today joined by several key leaders in our nation's efforts to address health care fraud. I am honored to be here with the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, Sylvia Burwell. Also, I have with me Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Leslie Caldwell, United States Attorney Wilfredo Ferrer of the Southern District of Florida, FBI Associate Deputy Director Dave Bowditch, HHS Deputy Inspector General for Investigations Gary Cantrell, DCIS Acting Director Dermot O'Reilly, and Shantanu Agrawal, Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Program Integrity at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We are here today to announce a significant step in the federal government's ongoing work to keep our nation's health care system <clears throat> free from fraud and exploitation and to ensure that taxpayer dollars are used lawfully and appropriately. Now, over the last three days, the Medicare Fraud Strike Force, a joint effort between the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, executed a significant nationwide health care fraud takedown. Now, this action involved charging or unveiling charges against approximately 300 defendants in 36 federal districts for their alleged participation in a variety of schemes involving more than $900 million in fraudulent billings. This makes this the largest takedown in the Strike Force's nine-year history. Now, the defendants who were named in these charges include doctors, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, home health care providers. They're accused of a wide range of serious crimes, from conspiring to commit health care fraud to making false statements, and from bribery to money laundering. They submitted dishonest claims, they charged excessive fees, and they prescribed unnecessary drugs. One group of defendants controlled a network of clinics in Brooklyn that they filled with patients through bribes and kickbacks. And these patients then received medically unnecessary treatment for which the clinic received over $38 million from Medicare and Medicaid, money that those conspirators subsequently laundered through more than 15 shell companies. In another case, a Detroit clinic billed Medicare for more than $36 million even though it was actually a front for a narcotics diversion scheme. Yet another defendant took advantage of his position in a state agency in Georgia by accepting bribes and recommending the approval of unqualified health care providers. Now these are just a few examples of the criminals that we've targeted in this operation. And although the specific nature of their wrongdoing varied from case to case, all of them, every one of them, betrayed the basic principles of their professions. Now, in addition to the usual patterns of fraud and deception that we've encountered in the past, we also saw new trends emerging in this year's charges. Now, for instance, in a number of cases involving the Medicare prescription drug program known as Part D, we saw new evidence of identity theft, including the use of stolen doctor's IDs to prepare fake prescriptions. Now, we've also seen a growing number of cases involving compounded medications. Now, these are the combinations of two or more drugs that are prepared by a licensed professional. And in recent years, the cost of these types of drugs, compounded medications, has grown exponentially, which makes them all the more attractive a target for criminals looking to exploit them for profit. Now, as this takedown should make clear, healthcare fraud is not an abstract violation. It's not a benign offense. It is a serious crime. And the wrongdoers that we pursue in these operations seek to use public funds for private enrichment. They target real people, many of them in need of significant medical care. They promise effective cures and therapies, but they provide none. And above all, they abuse the basic bonds of trust between doctor and patient, between pharmacist and doctor, and between taxpayer and government and they pervert them to their own ends. And the Department of Justice is determined to continue working to ensure that the American people know that their health care system works for them and for them alone. Now, in tackling these challenges, the Medicare Fraud Strike Force relies on close cooperation between the federal, state, and local governments. 
Since 2014, the Justice Department's Criminal Division has organized an annual National Healthcare Fraud Training Conference for assistant U.S. attorneys and state and federal law enforcement officers, which has substantially expanded the reach of our actions. More than 20 non-strike force U.S. attorneys' offices have participated in this year's takedown, helping us to combat health care fraud in a total of 36 federal districts nationwide, and they range from Alaska to Florida. We were also assisted by approximately 20 state Medicaid fraud control units, and this is a reflection of the close partnership that we have forged between state and federal authorities in combating health care fraud, a partnership that we will continue to strengthen in the days ahead. And let me thank my colleagues in the FBI, the Criminal Division, and the U.S. Attorney's Offices for their ongoing efforts to combat health care fraud. But let me also thank all of the state and local law enforcement officers across the country who participated in this complex and fast-moving takedown. And I look forward to continuing our work together in the days ahead. Now, this time, I will turn the podium over to Secretary Sylvia Burwell, who has been a dedicated leader. She has been an indispensable partner in this critical work, and she will provide additional details on today's announcement. Madam Secretary. Thank you very much, Attorney General Lynch, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I also want to thank my colleagues from HHS who are here, Deputy Inspector General Gary Cantrell, as well as our Director of the Center for Program Integrity at CMS, Dr. Agawa. Medicare has provided financial security and accessible health care to generations before us. It's a cornerstone of our health care system and a promise that we make to our children and our grandchildren. We have few responsibilities greater than ensuring its integrity, and that's why we will not tolerate fraud for this program or theft from the taxpayers. This administration is deeply committed to protecting Medicare and Medicaid and eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse. We've made it a priority at the Department of Health and Human Services, and as the Attorney General mentioned, this is the largest arrest in Medicare Fraud Strike Forces history, both in terms of the number of individuals, the dollar amounts, and the number of districts. This is the second year in a row that we have set a record for arrests and the second year that our investigation has stretched across the entire nation. For the second time, we pursued cases in non-strike force districts. We work closely with state and local partners, including state Medicaid fraud control units in 36 districts stretching from Florida to Alaska. Together, nearly 1,000 federal agents employed advanced analytics and used cutting-edge investigative work to find and expose 300 suspects. Today's action adds to an impressive list of accomplishments by the Strike Force. Since the Strike Force began in 2007, these teams have charged more than 2,900 defendants with defrauding Medicare of more than $8.9 billion. And the conviction rate for these defendants stands at 95%. These numbers prove that we are finding the people who try to defraud the taxpayers and we're bringing them to justice. Fighting fraud is a worthwhile investment for the American people. From 2013 through 2015, DOJ and HHS together recovered $6.10 for every dollar spent on fighting health care fraud. And that figure does not account for the fact that prosecutions likely deter others from committing fraud in the first place. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, we now have new tools and resources to fight fraud in federal health care programs. The law provides an additional $350 million for health care fraud prevention and enforcement efforts. Those funds have allowed the Justice Department to hire more prosecutors, and they've helped the strike force expand from two cities to nine. The law also toughens sentencing for criminal health care fraud. It enhances Medicare and Medicaid provider and supplier screening and enrollment requirements and requires data sharing across the federal government and with states so that Medicare and Medicaid can take concerted action together. To the members of this strike force, thank you for your work. With your help, we will prevent these vital programs from becoming targets, because keeping Medicare secure is a key part of our efforts to build a health care system that delivers better care, spends our dollars in smarter ways, and keeps our people healthy.
Thanks to this strike force and the many federal agents dedicated to fighting fraud to keep Medicare strong and the American people safe. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Attorney General. Thank you. All right, we'll take some questions. Madam Secretary, um, Paul Reed, CBS News. Uh, the complaint indicates that Tricare paid forty-six million dollars for compounded medication over a, a few months. Will they be able to recover that money? I know you, we may need to kick it to someone else, but will they be able to recover that? It's a rush to the podium. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, at this point, I'm not sure if I can answer that, that question. I think we would work really closely with our partners to try to do everything we can, not only instilling good controls now and working with them to try to assess how we do that in the future. I have a follow-up um, about criminal charges. I mean, will the pharmacy owners or the doctors writing these prescriptions, will they face criminal charges? So to the extent that we can prove that doctors or pharmacists uh, were intentionally engaged in fraud, they would face criminal charges. And in fact, in today's uh, charges, we have more than 60 healthcare professionals, including 28 doctors. Okay. Pete and Jeff. Yeah, a little more about the prescription uh, drug problem in the Medicaid Part D. Um, whose IDs are being stolen? Is it doctors or is it patients? And how does it work? Well, I'm aware that doctors' IDs were stolen. I'll turn it back over to Leslie if there's any additional information there. So doctors' IDs are sometimes stolen. Doctors sometimes uh, are participants in the fraud. We also see patients' IDs being stolen and patients voluntarily selling or renting or otherwise letting others use their IDs. Is, you say this is a relatively new problem. Does it seem to be sort of taking off exponentially? I think it's a relatively new problem because Part D is relatively new in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it is something that is uh, privately administered, so it's 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 susceptible to abuse. Um, the other thing that we've seen that's that was relatively new is, as the attorney general mentioned, the compounding creams. These compounding creams are uh, one of the things that we do in the strike forces is we look at the data in real time, and when we see a spike in something, uh, we we take action, and that's what we saw in compounding creams. We see these these creams, many of which are billed to Tricare. Uh, selling for twelve thousand dollars a bottle, and um, there's been a huge spike in those. And so, when we saw that, we immediately focused our energy on the compounding creams, and that's why they're in this indictment. I would just add, with regard to the issues around Medicare Part D, as I think many of you all know, it's a growing program, and you probably also recognize the issue of high cost drugs. So, the issue of where criminals are going, where there is, it's a new program, relatively new. It's a program that's growing, and it's a program where the issue of high cost drugs exacerbates that there's money flowing in those spaces. Um, in terms of the efforts we're taking today, at the prevention end, we are also working. And next year, what we want to do is make sure that those providers that go into the Part D system will have to do uh, register for Medicare screening. And we've used the screening as an important tool to prevent by bad providers coming in. We do analytics around people coming in, understand if they're high risk. Some of those may require fingerprinting and background checks, criminal checks, before they can come into the system. Some of this screening has resulted in about 575,000 providers and suppliers coming out. And so the tool we're using in other parts of Medicare, we want to now go to using in Part D. And so that's a little bit on the prevention. Your question was where we are today. But I think the prevention is important as well. May I just follow up on creams? Are you saying cream, C-R-E-A-M-S? And if so, what are they for? In terms of my familiarity with the specifics of the cases, I should probably defer to um, justice. They're creams that are uh, for wounds and scars. Uh, they're pain creams. And the reason why many of them are being mailed to TRICARE is because they're being marketed to military veterans. On that point, uh, officials have said that CMS created controls and monitoring systems more than a year ago to detect fraud specifically related to compounding creams. But Tricare took a lot longer. But Tricare took a lot looking and worrying about that stuff. In the process, more than a billion dollars supposedly in fraud is going out the door. Why did Tricare take so much longer than CMS to start looking and finding this problem? I would have to uh, refer that question back to the Defense Health Agency. Uh, not exactly sure how the controls came into place a year later. But you know, you're not seeing the same type of compounding fraud to Medicare specifically. You're seeing it to Tricare. We saw it to try. And we saw it to try, Kara. I can't speak to what's going on with Medicare. Talk about Medicare. 
Okay. Uh, with the compounding investigations, generally speaking, we are uh, sometimes impacted in the Medicare program, but the dollars are generally much smaller than the TRICARE. So, but we have seen fraud in compounding in Medicare. Right, but my question is why do you think that is? Why do you think the fraudsters are driving so much towards TRICARE and not Medicare? You want to address this, sir? So I think it's an important question, and controls around all of these payments really start uh, at the beginning. So uh, th there's an important difference in the Medicare program around the payment policy for compounded drugs. Uh, generally, we pay providers for the cost of getting those drugs and then a small administrative fee in order to actually do the compounding. That means that there's less surplus there, less of an attractant for bad actors to take advantage of compounded drugs. I think to the Secretary's earlier point, there's a lot that we're trying to do on the prevention, ed to, uh, uh, prevention edge to get every single provider uh, enrolled in the Medicare program, uh, whether they're in Part D or any other part of the program. Um, we are applying a lot of our advanced analytics to the Part D program uh, using uh, our track record in A and B and looking to have the same kind of preventive uh, impact in Part D that we currently have in other parts of the program. We'll take one more question. Thank you. I have a question actually on Orlando. Attorney General, whose idea was it to edit the 911 transcripts? Well, in the review that was being done in terms of making those available, uh, the goal is, of course, the greatest transparency possible. The initial thought was we did not want to provide a further platform for the propaganda of the killer. Uh, but once, once it became an issue, we decided that, that we would go ahead and release the full transcript, which is out now. So you should have that. If I could just, my, my question is, who, where did the idea originate? Was it yourself, the FBI director, or with the locals? I'm not going to go into the details of the process behind it. Our view was not to, as I said, further um, spread the propaganda, but once it became a distraction, we released the full transcript. And so you have that now. Several people have come forward and said that they've had same-sex sexual relationships uh, with Mateen. Are you interviewing those people? Well, as I said before, we are interviewing everyone who has indicated they've had contact with Mateen over the days and weeks and months prior to this incident. And if individuals come forward with any information uh, involving contact with him, they're individuals that we would be interested in interviewing. I'm not going to be able to give you the specifics of who we're talking to right now because that is part of the ongoing investigation, but that is something that we're looking into. We're trying to find out essentially all motivations he may have had for this attack. Because I think that people are, are confused um, as to why the Are you getting evidence and information that you haven't brought to the public yet that leads you to believe that this was a hate crime? As we, have, as we have always said, this was clearly an act of terror and an act of hate. People can have more than one motivation. And of course, we are trying to determine was one a predominant motivation? You know, what led him to either of those particular motivations? So because this is an ongoing matter, we are trying to get information out as quickly as we can, but we, we, we can't do it in a way that would compromise the investigation. We are still interviewing anyone who may have had contact with him to determine what led him to this point. We've talked about um, the, uh, the uh, online radicalization that he did appear to undergo. We've talked about um, the statements he made in the past, those are clearly part of the picture as well. I would caution anyone in trying to, at this point, ascribe a percentage point to anything just because we want to make sure that we get it accurate and we want to make sure that we look at everything that we can. So. Thanks, everybody.